Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning service. We are very glad to, uh, that you are here. Um, we pray that uh, you've had a good week, and uh, today we hope that you will find some refreshment in the Lord's words. So I'm going to begin uh, with the Lord's words, and I'm going to be uh, uh, reading from uh, Psalm uh, chapter 12 and verses 1 through 8. Psalm chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Help, Lord, for no one is faithful any more. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone, everyone lies to their neighbour. They flatter with their lips, but harbour deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say, by our tongues we will prevail. Our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked. The wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honoured by the human race. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time together as we immerse ourselves again in your word. Your word is truth. And Father, we just thank you, Father, that we have an anchor on which we can hold on to in this crazy world. For many people, this week will have been a mad one. For some, it will have been a time of peace. Whatever state the people arrive today to listen to your word, I pray that they will find sustenance, that they will find respite, that they will find a place in which they can rest their weary souls. I pray these things and ask for your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to, now going to invite uh, Ben to come up and bring us our two readings for this morning. Thanks, Chris, and it's uh, great to be here with you guys again this week and reading the Word. It's just such a, a pleasure to be able to read the, the, the Bible to uh, everyone listening. Uh, the first verse is from John 1, 1, 1 John 1, 5 to 10. And it's about light and darkness, sin and forgiveness. This is the message we have heard. From him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Now the second verse is in John, the Gospel of John. Uh, number 18, verses 33 through to 38. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are the king, then said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the very reason I was born and came into this world is to testify of the, to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews, gathered, 
went out there to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for charge against him. And this is the word of the Lord for this week and can't wait to hear what um, Chris has to share with us about these ones. It's going to be pretty awesome. So we'll get him back and yeah, come with open ears. Thanks, Chris. All right, thank you, Ben, for that reading. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting into this uh, word from the Lord uh, with you this morning. So the title of my message is, What is Truth? What is Truth? And it's taken from a question that Jesus was asked by Pontius Pilate when Pilate was trying to determine what he was going to do with Jesus. Ben just read this passage to us, but we're just going to rehearse a small portion of it again from John 18, verse 37, and the first part of uh, verse 38. The passage reads, You are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then Pilate, of course, asked that question that has been debated for centuries ever since. And we might ask ourselves, was Pilate sincere? Uh, was he sarcastic? Nobody really knows, but uh, his question was, what is truth? What is truth? And to answer that question is so very, very important today because it determines so very much about our lives. In fact, at a very basic level, here's why it is important, and it's simply this. What you believe determines how you will live. Let me repeat that for you. What you believe will determine how you behave, how you live. And it, deter it determines how you behave relationally, it determines how you behave materially, it determines how you ba behave uh, financially, it determines how you behave, of course, morally. And ultimately, it determines how you behave spiritually, which in turn will determine what happens to you after this life. So what you believe to be true determines how you behave, and not just consciously, but sometimes subconsciously as well. And I want to illustrate this for you. We can read a verse such as Psalm 97 and verse 2, which says, May all who are godly be happy. May all who are godly be happy. Now that sounds really wonderful. So if you're godly, then the psalmist, and by inference uh, God himself, wishes for you to be happy. But what happens is that uh, we consciously or sometimes subconsciously, we infer things from this, uh, this idea that simply aren't true. For example... If God wants me to be happy and it turns out that I'm not happy, then God has failed me. da -dum. Okay, I'm trying to emulate those uh, game show uh, buttons, you know, where the buzzer goes off and, sorry, wrong answer. da -dum. So Proverbs, 14, Proverbs uh, chapter 14, verse 12 reads this. It says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So what this means is that wrong thinking can kill you. Believing something is true when it's not, or conversely, believing something is false when it is true, can sometimes be fatal. But believe me when I say that a lot of people are following this pattern of thinking in the world today. And ultimately, as the, as the proverb says, it will be terminal. In the meantime, people invite a whole lot of carnage into their lives simply by believing the wrong thing. Now here's the rub. Without a belief in absolute truth from an absolute truth giver, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but without a belief in absolute moral truth, then truth becomes whatever we want it to be, whatever makes us happy. And when the bottom line is my own happiness, then my happiness becomes the standard, the arbitrable by which I judge my own actions, my own behaviour and even the actions of other people. Going one step further, since God, according to the psalmist, wants me to be happy, then the implication is that anything that doesn't make me happy must be very bad, very bad indeed. So things like discomfort, delay, risk, suffering, inconveniences, obstacles, none of these can possibly be God's will for my life, right? Da-dum, there's that buzzer again. 
And before we know it, we begin to worship the false gods of comfort, money, pleasure, power and stuff. So you can see how all of this works. What you believe to be true absolutely determines how you will behave. So why did Jesus come into the world? He came to testify to the truth. But there is one who exists who totally opposes the truth. And scripture calls him Satan or Lucifer or the great deceiver or the father of lies or any number of other titles. Jesus came to represent the truth, but the enemy who is called the father of lies does anything he can to oppose the truth. Have a look at John chapter 8 and verse 44. It says, The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not, up, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. How do we know he's lying? His lips are moving. It's as simple as that. Many people also say this about barristers and politicians, but uh, it's certainly true of our enemy in whom there is no truth. But Jesus came to testify to the truth, and Satan is revealed as the father of lies. Now, Satan, of course, is very cunning. He's very sly, and he's not going to tell you a lie that is so outlandish that you're going to go, now, come on, that's just so stupidly obvious. No, he is the great counterfeiter. He's going to give you something that looks true, feels true, sounds true, something that could even be called true-ish, because if he came to you with some kind of outlandish lie, you would spot it a mile off. But he knows that if he regularly gives you something that is only slightly off being true, over the course of time and accepting these small inconspicuous lies, then eventually you're going to find yourself way off the baseline of what is true. Indeed, very far from the truth. And this is what he's doing today, very subtly. He's injecting small amounts of error in critical places in our lives, knowing that over the course of time, without something else happening to correct this, then one day that we will just wake up and we will find ourselves gagging on a litany of lies and very, very far from the truth. It's a wee bit like something, uh, something like a cat. The cat licks its own fur and it's grooming in the course of grooming and it's not really a problem for the cat, but small amounts of fur make its way down into the cat's stomach. And it's all okay for a while, but then at some point, up it comes. It's a, it's a fur ball. It's what's known as a fur ball. And I don't know if you've ever seen a cat do that. I have a cat and it's incredibly gross when that happens. So over time, we can find ourselves exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And you can see the results of this in Romans 1. And we're going to look at a, a few different verses here. Verse 18, verse 22, and verse 25 of Romans 1, if you want to follow along with me. Beginning in Romans 1, verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Down in verse 22, Although they claim to be wise, which is what's happening today, you know, we're, we're all so very uh, enlightened, aren't we? You know, we, we know more than our parents, more than you, more than me, you know, all that stuff. Um, and all, and, and th this is all just a lie, but it says, although they claim to be wise, they became fools. They became fools. Verse 25 says uh, what they did as a result of this, and it says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. Looks true, sounds true, feels true, but it's actually a lie. So let me just tell you this. What we're talking about here is what I believe to be one of the biggest problems facing the current generation. The willingness to buy into one of the most dangerous and false belief systems ever created. In fact, ever since the so-called Age of Enlightenment came upon us, beginning with the late uh, 17th century and on into the 18th century, our spiritual enemy, Satan, has leveraged two great weapons used to great effect in the world today. The first of these weapons is relativism, and the second is subjectivism. So relativism and subjectivism, these are two great isms that you should become uh, familiar with, if only to know when the weapons, these weapons are being used against you. So what is relativism? 
Relativism is the assumption that there is no such thing as absolute truth, that all truth is simply relative to any other truth, hence the name relativism. On the basis of this assumption, then, truth is evolving. It is never constant. Your truth might be different to my truth, relatively speaking. Forget about divine authority. Forget about absolute truth. It doesn't exist in relativism. And this is the mindset upon which our children are feasting in schools all across the Western world, in particular in our universities, everywhere in our educational system. This is rampant. For example, in parts of our Western world today, students from primary age all the way through to secondary and university age are being indoctrinated in a new narrative which questions the history of the Jewish Holocaust. You know, we, many of us who are older, like, uh, like me, we, we know this stuff from our history. We were taught it. Six million Jews and many, many other uh, ethnic groups also died during the Jewish Holo Holocaust. What is the consequence of all of this, of not teaching these things properly? Well, statistically, a sharp increase in anti-Semitism all around the globe. It's horrible. I read an article recently about a man in France who killed a Jewish woman in 2017 in an anti-Semitic frenzy. This man crying, Allahu Akbar, and I killed the devil, beat up a 65-year-old woman before throwing her out of the window of her Paris apartment. Just awful. And there is a lot to this story, including the involvement of the uh, French president, Emmanuel Macron. But the other shocking aspect of this case was that the French High Court ruled that the man could not stand trial because of acute mental delirium brought about by the consumption of cannabis. But the ruling that the French court handed down sent a very clear message. And the message was this, that use of narcotics causing delirium could be used as a basis to absolve someone of criminal responsibility. And as the president of the Representative Council of Jewish Institutions in France said, from now on in our country, people can torture and kill Jews with complete impunity. This is the world that we live in, a world without absolute moral truth, a world, as I said last Sunday, in which evil is called good and good is called evil. So how many of you were alive in the 1950s? Now, I can't see you through this camera, of course, but you know, raise your hands if you were born in the 1950s. Okay, so in the 1950s, would you agree that marriage was uh, considered a sacred institution? So even though I can't see you, just raise your hands if you agree with that. And now I want to ask, if uh, ask uh, who of you were around in the 1960s, just a decade later or so, and you can raise your hands if you, if you, if you want. And I'm going to say, well, wherever you are, if you just raised your hand to that last question, you were around in the 1960s, then I know automatically that you can't be telling the truth because they say that if you were around in the 60s, you wouldn't remember any of it. Okay, so I'm, I'm kidding with that one, but that's that's completely untrue, well, almost completely untrue, but for those of you who are around in the 1960s, you know that free love was a really big thing on the scene in, the, in, the, in that decade. Fidelity wasn't nearly as important to much of society back then as it was in the 50s, and a lot of promiscuity was taking place, and marriages, of course, bore the brunt of that. Okay, so here's two lines of, thoughts from, two, lines of thought from two different decades. On the one hand, we have marriage, which is sacred, and on the other hand, we have its opposite thought, which is free love is the hip way to live, and these thoughts are then smooshed together uh, in, in a process which is called thesis plus antithesis uh, equals synthesis, something which is known as the Hegelian dialectic. We're not going to go into that. But you smoosh these things together, and all of a sudden, voila, you come up with a new relative truth, which basically says something like this, Marriage is okay, but you can take it or leave it. You know, you don't have to commit to it. If you, don't, if you find that you don't like it in marriage, then you can always bail out at any time that you like. So you see how these, these two truths came together and created a new relative truth. Under the doctrine of relativism, all this is a perfectly legitimate way to think. So what about subjectivism? What's that all about? Well, subjectivism says that I, the subject, 
have the right to determine what is right and what is wrong without any reference whatsoever to an external source, without any external authority outside of myself having any input. Following right on the heels of relativism, this, this particular way of looking at things, subjectivism, uh, since there's no absolute truth, then basically what it's saying is you can't impose your beliefs or your views upon me and neither can anyone else, not even God, not even God. You or I become the source of our own truth and we determine if our actions are right or wrong based on how we feel. And if it feels good to me, then it must be true. If it makes me feel happy, then that's really all that matters. As long as I don't hurt anyone, uh, then it really doesn't matter what I do. Huh. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, out there in the cyberspace are uh, starting to go, now, wait a minute, hang about. Isn't this all really sounding a whole lot like uh, Genesis 3 all over again? You know, I am my own God, small g. I make my own decisions, and since so then, uh, who needs God with a capital G? Well, under the rules of relativism and subjectivism, that's perfectly valid thinking. But here's the danger. When I base my life on these false philosophies of relativism and subjectivism, then these in turn are going to determine how I behave. And if I allow myself to step away just the tiniest little bit from the truth, over the course of time I can suddenly wake up years later and find myself very, very far from what is actually true, according to the one who, who uh, defines truth, which is, of course, God. Relativism and subjectivism, powerful weapons in the hand of our spiritual enemy today. And people are just being swallowed up left, right and centre because these two ways of viewing the world have become our staple diet in the West in particular ever since the mid to late, uh, to the mid to late 19th century. So where do we go, through, go to from here? Well, can I just ask you to take a giant leap of faith here and make the assumption that there is such a thing as absolute truth. And for those of you who might take umbrage, umbrage to that and say, now wait a minute, you can't say that. You can't be absolutely sure that there is absolute truth. And then I say to you, yes I can, because it's all relative anyway, isn't it? Okay, I'm, I'm just messing with you, but you get the idea. But please bear with me for a minute, and let's just assume that it is possible for a seeker of the truth to actually find truth and I'm talking about the absolute truth. Now let me follow that up with a very important statement. When we ask the question, what is truth? We need to understand this, and that is that truth is not just a what, but it is also a who. Let me repeat that because it's crucial to getting to the bottom of this. Truth is not just a what, it is also a who. It's not just a philosophy, it's not just a concept, it's not just an idea, it's not just something that you can learn from a book, but it's also a who. Truth is a person. Now take a look at this. I'm going to back this up. In the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a bold claim. He says in John 14 and, and uh, John chapter 14 verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying, I am truth. He's also saying, I am God in the flesh. I represent and I define truth. Not only that, but I want you to also look at John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and we're also going to pick up verse 14. John 1, verses 1 and 2 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Down in verse 14, the Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And there's the crux of it right there. Grace and truth, truth and grace. These are beautiful stablemates together. So why is it that so many people today reject the statement that Jesus is truth? It's not because of the life that Jesus lived. If you just look at uh, who Jesus was as a person, even those people who hate Christianity, if they have any sense of right and wrong, they will generally accept that Jesus was a great person who lived a great life. So what's the rub then? Well, simply this. It's how Christians have represented Jesus. 
Truthfully, when we look at our own lives compared to that of Jesus, we don't do it terribly well, do we? Jesus lived this life full of grace. But we, well, we just don't seem to do this very well very often. We're often hypocritical, we're all too often judgmental, and we really don't show a whole lot of grace to one another, do we? Not the kind of mercy and, and compassion that Jesus so wonderfully represented. And so when people on the outside of the church, they look at us, they often instinctively reject Jesus because Christians have been all about representing the truth, but with very, very little or no grace. And there's also the flip side to this as well, which is also a really big problem and a growing problem which is creeping into many churches today. The very offspring, in fact, of relativism and subjectivism, which I just spoke about, and that is grace without truth. Okay? And grace without truth leads naturally to an anything goes type of mindset. Does that sound familiar to you? And God then is transformed into a God of unending tolerance. Everything is okay so long as we are sincere and so long as no one gets hurt. That's the rhetoric. But here's the truth. When Jesus came, he came full of grace and truth. And when you seek his grace and when you seek his truth, it's absolutely life-changing, totally life-changing. And that is absolutely true. And if you're a truth seeker and you're willing to explore that for all your worth, here is what you will find. Jesus, the truth, can set you free. Jesus can set you free. Here's what he said in John chapter 8 and verse 32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What will it set you free from? It will set you free from so-called truths that are not really true. It will set you free from all of the lies and error that looks true, but is not true. And it will set you free from that horrible sucking void of relativism and subjectivism that will just swallow you up, suck you dry and spit you back out again. And it will free you from false beliefs that will take you away from the truth of honouring God with your life. There is so much more that Jesus will set you free from. The truth is, Jesus Christ, um, well, it is Jesus Christ. The truth is Jesus Christ, period. And if you pursue him, then you will find him. And when you find him, then he will set you free. As the Gospel of John records, if the Son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. Now, just in conclusion, as I said at the beginning, Jesus came to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth will listen to him. So how do we most effectively listen to Jesus? And I'm going to tell you, it's very, very simple. If you have a Bible in your possession, then you are well on your way. Read it. Truly, read it. Study it. From Genesis to Revelation, you will find Jesus in its pages if you are truly willing to openly seek him. And the truth is, the truth is, that's it for today. You might be glad to hear that. No, hopefully not. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. We're done for today, except that I'm going to uh, say also, this is my gratuitous plug. If you would like to know more about God's truth, if you are a serious student of the Bible, then can I encourage you to sign up for our upcoming Bible study that I talked about uh, last week. And I'm going to ask Ben if he could once again put our email address on the end of this message uh, so that you can contact us and let us know that you're interested. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, when Pilate asked the question, what is truth? He had no idea that he was literally staring truth in the face. Sometimes today we find ourselves in the same place, deceived by the relativistic and subjective doctrines of truth, so-called truth, being promoted in the world by our enemy. Father, we pray, may the glorious light of your eternal spirit burn the scales away from our eyes 
so that we can experience the true depths of your truth now and forever. We thank you for your presence with us as we opened up your word and we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is truth. In his name we pray and we give you thanks. Amen. All right, so we've come to the point in time where I just want to briefly talk about uh, our offering. Um, again, I want to thank many of you uh, who are giving incredibly generously online. Uh, that really is a help to us to keep the lights on and to be able to, us to be able to continue doing what we're doing here in this online forum and also in uh, present in the church, uh, the literal building church on Sunday morning. So thank you for your gifts. Thank you for investing in God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your glory revealed in the pages of scripture. The truth which anchors us firmly to the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Father, it is an honour and privilege to be able to be a part of your kingdom work. You call us as ambassadors, you call us as kingdom priests in order to do your work on earth before you call us home. And we are honoured and privileged to be a part of this. And so thank you, Father, that we can serve you in this way. Multiply our gifts, that your kingdom will be uh, advanced and that your name will be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so I pray and hope that you've enjoyed our uh, time here this morning, that uh, you've been edified and uplifted and uh, you have a much better picture of what truth is. Truth is not only a concept, truth is actually more than that, it's a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So let me can, uh, finish our morning together with a blessing, and I'm reflecting again on the subject of truth, and I want to offer you a passage from Romans 15, in closing, where it says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures, and the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. And so may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless you all, and have a great week.